Very nice to be here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a couple, just a couple of works of mine. Um, one fairly recent work I did last year, and um, another very much earlier work. But before I do, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my background, you know, where I studied, and um, and how that, where I studied, informed my practice. Well, first of all, first off, I went to Dundee. I'm from Glasgow originally, but I went to Duncan and Jordanston to um, uh, specialise in sculpture. And, and then it was only when I went to <coughs> Belfast to do my MA that I started working with sound. And um, yeah, so I started working, I started thinking about <coughs> the sculptural aspects of sound while I was a student in Dundee. And uh, I always like to sing. And while I started thinking about what happens when you, when, you, when you sing and how that's a very sculptural experience and the physicality of singing and what happens when you project your voice out into a room and how the sound can define space. So I started thinking about sound in kind of, yeah, sculptural, spatial terms. So then when I did my MA, I started working with um, <coughs> sound and sculpture. And uh, so I suppose what you could say is my main concerns in my work are the, the architectural um, and spatial concerns of sound and how they can define space and also the emotive and the psychological effects of sound and how, and song in particular, and how it can act as a trigger for memory, how it, how it can act as a, a device to alter your individual consciousness in a particular place or time. And you know, I've worked in lots of different types of spaces, not only in gallery and museum spaces, but I work a lot in public space, and I'm interested in how public happen upon my sound installations. And I mean, I'll, I'll go on to talk about that later, but uh, I thought I would start with this. I mean, I wouldn't normally perform live, but this is my, I'm going to start with my one and only um, live performance in a supermarket called Tesco Metro. It was part of the Bex Futures Award in, um, in London in 2004. And uh, so I'll, I have to apologise for the poor quality of this video. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to uh, play the video and then tell you a bit more about it after that. So if you could just start with that first video, please. Two sound pieces explore the way that song can trigger memory. She recently staged a performance which involved her singing into the public address system of a Tesco supermarket. Loves the sun. Who cares that it is shining? Who cares what it does since you broke my heart? Someone sing. 
and it's clearly not a trained singing voice, um, disembodied voice. So it's almost like you're hearing something quite private, and, you know, and you have this feeling that you're eavesdropping or something. So what happens is you become very aware of, of the place that you're in. You know, when you're shopping in the supermarket, you're not really aware of your environment. You're only like you're in autopilot and you're thinking about what you're going to get in for the dinner, and then. But this, the sound just cuts over everything. You know, it's the PA system it really does cut out everything, cut over everything, so that you can really there's a discernible dip in the ambient sound that people encounter the work. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about the next work. Um, which is You're Not Alone. No, it's uh, yeah. um, You're Not Alone, which I did with um, Modern Art Oxford in 2009. And Modern Art Oxford invited me to come and see this uh, wonderful observatory in Oxford, which is part of the university. And, uh, but it's no longer used as an observatory anymore. And I was struck with, by how beautiful it is. But sadly, I mean, sadly, it wasn't an observatory for long because they had built it to observe the transit of Venus, this comet. And then, but in the end, it, it such poor visibility from where they were, they moved everything out to another observatory. So it was a bit of a white elephant. And it's used by the students to study and, you know, various functions, but other than that, it's, it lies empty. And then over the years, buildings grew up around it, <coughs> which meant it became obscured from view. And um, it was only recently when the Radcliffe Infirmary was, was torn down that you can actually see it again in, in, its, in its full glory. And you can just about see it on the left-hand side. This is after they've pulled down the, the infirmary. And then you can see, you can see on the left-hand side the, the observatory. Um, so I started, like, as well as thinking about its original function as an observatory, a place that you observe the night sky, I, I was thinking about, it was modelled on this Tower of the Winds, and an upper century BC clock tower in, in Athens. And, um, and essentially it was a, a clock, a timepiece, and, uh, and, uh, and these are the architectural drawings by uh, Stuart and Revit. So I started thinking about the concept of time, which brought me to look into Marconi, who was the pioneer of, of radio, and there's a big Marconi collection in Oxford. So, um, and I'd remember reading Marconi say um, that when sounds are generated, they never actually die away completely, and that they're, every sound you make is, 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 the, the, is still there out in the universe, you know, reverberating. I just thought that was a very evocative notion. So, um, so I, I started to investigate radio, and uh, I came across these things known as radio interval signals. <clears throat> and radio interval signals were, were something that each, every radio station had between broadcasts, and it would determine you know, which radio station you were tuning into in between uh, programs. You know, so it, it, it was a bit like a, a test card that you might get on television, or you know, and each, each radio had its own particular signature tune, you know. And so there's, there's hundreds of these radio interval signals from all over the world, and I selected 30 of them, and um, no, originally 50, and uh, <coughs> from as far away as the, uh, the voice of the people of Ho Chi Minh City to Radio Berlin International to Radio Faroe Islands to, you know, and I chose the more, the older ones because they were sort of simpler, and I preferred those, so it was just kind of, kind of Kind of melancholy, distant sound to them, and they're produced by these radio interval signal uh, generators, and uh, a bit like a music box. And like I say, each radio station had their own. And so what I did is record um, each of the radio interval signals on vibraphone, and vibraphone has a very similar sound to the original 
chain, chaining sound of a, of a radio interval signal, but it, to me it has a much more sort of spatial feel and it suggests infinity and, and, and as it resonates in the space. So I had uh, 50 of these radio interval signals, played one by before and recorded each one, and then have them transmitted from modern art Oxford, right across the city, to the observatory via radio. So this is the receiver in, in the observatory. And it was like a surround sound installation, four speakers. <coughs> I'm play the, the video, if that's, again, it's a bit of bad quality for you. time I won't talk about these works. Okay. So 
Like I said before, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in how people, uh, you know, place and work uh, in public space where they happen upon it unexpectedly. But in this case, this is an exhibition called Surround Me, a song cycle for the City of London. And um, I was invited by Art Angel, the, the Commission of Art in Public Space. And they asked me last, in 2010, uh, if I would, if I would uh, work with them, but it just so happened it was the same year as uh, the Turner Prize, and so, so I did, So I thought, well, maybe that's a bit much to take on. But in the end, I mean, I've been waiting for ages for our agent to ask me to invite me to to, to do something because you know I work on, as I say, I've been working in public space for a long time. And finally, they, you know, they noticed me, but it's like two things happening at once, and I thought, oh. But then, um, but in the end, it, I decided to go ahead with it, and it actually worked out really well, because it gave people in London an idea of how I also work in public, uh, because the work that I was no nominated for was a, a work in public space. Mm -hmm. But then each, each of the artists worked within the gallery, as in the exhibition. So this, this uh, slide you see here is a slide of the <coughs> stock exchange in London, which has been, this area has been in the news quite a lot recently because of the occupations that are going on at the moment. Uh, and it was originally here at the stock exchange, but they were moved to um, St Paul's. But anyway, I digress. This is <coughs> the right in the centre of London, the city of London, no, the financial district. Um, so when our, when our angel asked me to cut, to, to, to do a project with them, I do what I always do. I go in with fresh eyes to see, to find a site, you know, and the things that I look for in, in, in a place are usually the, you know, the architecture, look at interest in architecture, acoustics, atmosphere, history. And uh, so I, I gravitated towards the financial district because that's where all the, the more interesting places it, architecture is. But then was struck by how incredibly silent it was um, at the weekend. And because I went at the weekend and uh, everything's closed, like all the shops and all the cafes and bars and, and offices are closed. And so it's got this eerie silence. So I'm wandering around the, 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 the financial district and I'm coming across bits of the old walls, where, where, as it used to be an old walled city. So I started thinking about how it was back in, uh, when it was an old walled city and, and, uh, and how prevalent, how present the, the human voice would have been then compared to now with all the traffic sounds and machinery. And so I started to look into the 16th century uh, for inspiration. And, um, <coughs> Yeah, like I say, the, the voice was very present in, in the streets of, of, of the city. And right where the old walls, right where the financial district is, used to be where the marketplace was, where uh, every, people would trade. And, um, and a lot of the composers and, and writers of the time, like Shakespeare, would, would often mention street traders. And composers of the time, like Thomas Ravenscroft, he was really enthused by the the cries of the street traders because in order to be heard over one another you had to develop a sort of system or a way of, of, of calling out across the space but with that but in, in, almost in harmony so you could be heard so you could understand why it would have been inspiring to them it sounded quite musical and so I particularly liked Ravenscroft because he uses the um, the real cries of the, the street traders not the idealised ones that many of the other composers used so, so I was looking at Thomas Gravenscroft, uh, his rounds, and he compiled this book of city rounds, or canons, where one voice follows the other. And uh, there was one in particular, uh, and at the same time, I come across this uh, Delbeni uh, etching, an Italian poet, and this is a, a, um, an image of uh, the, the mind is a... Um, the, the five senses of the walled city, 
And the, um, so that's exactly at the, at the same time as the, as the Freedom Cross, 1609. So I started thinking about themes of, of circulation and rounds, and then looking into these 60th century composers. Um, okay, now this is an aerial view of, of, of London, and right at the epicentre of, of, of London is the financial district. And that's where the old wall, the wall used to be. So that's six, so I made six separate installations that were interrelated, that responded to each of the six sites, and they all had their very particular reasons for being there. And the things that um, linked each of the works was these themes of circulation and fluidity and and water. I'm going to try and use this. Okay, so this is um, Ravenscroft, one of the Ravenscroft Rounds New Oysters. And the site I chose for this was this, old, this um, little alleyway that you, you probably would have walked past. It's, um, you know, and it uh, interweaves, and it's right, in the, right next to the Stock Exchange. And there's three adjoining alleyways, and so I, I used that for the three parts of the New Oysters um, by, by Ravenscroft. Change Alley, and that was the site for Ravenscroft's New Oysters, a song about trading, trading in oysters. And uh, the reason I chose that is, well, I came across this um, poem by poem by, jo by Jonathan Swift called "The Bubble," and uh, I'm just going to read it out to you from my iPhone. <laughs> there is a gulf for thousands fell. Here all the bold adventurers came. A narrow sound, though deep as hell. Change Alley is the dreadful name. Nine times a day it ebbs and flows, yet he that on the surface lies, without a pilot seldom knows the time it falls or when it will rise. Subscribers here by thousands float and jostle one another down, each paddling to his creaky boat, and here they fish for gold and drown. So that was the... Jonathan Swift, uh, 1721.
So, like I say, the song is about trading, but and it's very close to the stock exchange, but Change Alley was where the real trading took place. People went to the coffee houses and speculated in the, in the East Indies, and that's where apparently the first bubble was supposed to have burst there in Change Alley. So this uh, this is this, um, next in the one of the, the cycle called the Lacrimy, the Lacrimy or Seven Tears, and. It takes its title from John Dowland's Lacrimy, and Lacrimy, like I say, means tear. And he um, he makes he did this uh, composition, which was his signature tune. I mean, John Dowland was like a rock star for his time. He was really famous, and he wrote this this uh, adaptation of on the theme of this motif of a single falling tear, seven different variations on the same theme. And. Um, for, for strings, for viols. So what I've done <coughs> is I've asked a, vi a violinist to play each of the seven lacrimae, and there's seven notes in each of the lacrimae. So what I've done is ask him to play e each of the notes individually, so it comes from its own individual speaker, and then had each of the seven speakers placed in the facade of this very corporate building in Milk Street, um, in the financial district. Again, it's a very, very different kind of type of space than the one previously. And um, yeah, so I'm just going to play that video. Oh no. Uh, so this is John Dowland's score. Yeah, I'll play this video. <laughs> hear the lacrimy in that, but it's, I mean, it sounds very abstract because he's playing each note separately without listening to the, the previous note, if you understand, so it sounds like it's broken up, so it comes together and, and falls away again. And yeah, yeah like I say, I, I, like, I like the way people can happen upon my work unexpectedly, but in this situation it was different because I invited people into the city uh, the financial district at the weekend when you wouldn't normally go there. And so people had a map and you could walk, walk from each location to the next. So I think this is probably my favourite um, location. It's Murfield High Walkway near the Barbican. And it's like I say, right in the heart of the city. And it is completely empty. I mean, it looks like people have just left overnight. It's got this post-apocalyptic feel about it, you know, you can still see the curtain, curtains in the windows, and it's very, very eerie. 
And uh, this was the site for um, John Bennett's Weep Oh My Eyes. Again, with these themes of, of water and tears, they all seem to be about very melancholic um, songs. I suppose in those, in those days there was a lot to be melancholic about. Uh, with the plague and, and all that and the fire. And, and anyway. So this, this was the site for another um, surround inst installation for speakers. And in We Call My Eyes is a Madrigal. And the madri a Madrigal came from Italy and it was designed <coughs> to, to give the illusion that you didn't have to draw breath when, when you sing. Yeah, but like, you know, so suggesting a heaven, heavenly body. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, I'm just going to play that video. Each of the um, four parts, the soprano, the tenor, the bass, and the alto part, and each uh, voice came from each its own individual speaker. So it wasn't, as you heard it there, it had four separate speakers, four separate voices in each corner of the square. Now this is a back to the financial district. Um, Token House Shard, <coughs> and I'm just going to read you this um, quote from Daniel Defoe. Um, Passing through Token House Yard in Lothbury, of a sudden a casement violently opened just over my head, and a woman gave three frightful screeches and then cried, Oh death, death, death in a most inimitable tone, which struck me with horror and a chilliness in my very blood. There was nobody to be seen in the whole place, neither did any other window open, for people had no curiosity now in any case, nor could anybody help one another. So that's uh, Daniel Defoe's account of the plague in London. So if you, you know, if you look at the end of the street, you're looking right onto the Bank of England, and so that was the, the reason I chose uh, this uh, Orlando Gibbons uh, sw uh, Silver Swan. And it's basically, it's a swan song about the, uh, you know, about the end of an era. And I thought, <coughs> yeah, 
well, there's a lot. I mean, it might take other connotations in that particular context. So I'll just play that video.